James chapter 5, verse 7 through 12. Coming into the end, I'm praying about what we'll be doing next, and I have an idea where we'll be going in the Bible next, after James, but James chapter 5, tonight, and we'll read verses 7 through 12. We'll look at this, this evening on the idea of be patient, be patient. James chapter 5, verse 7 through 12, begins with those words, verse 7, be patient, therefore, brethren, Unto the coming of the Lord, behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth not. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And above all things, my brethren, oh, we have stopped verse, verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 11. I wrote verse 12. Verse 11, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. The Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. And tender mercy. Let's stop there. I put 12 down. I should stop at 11. But let's pray, and we'll get into the message tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time. Thank you for this passage of Scripture that teaches us about patience. And Lord, as we look and wait for the coming of the Lord and look for the day when Christ shall return to this earth. Help us to do so with patience and endurance, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And tonight, Lord, help us to grow in this area of patience. Help us to grow in ourselves, Lord, please, that we may be a great witness for thee on this earth. Thank you for this time again. We pray now for your blessing on this passage of Scripture, and we ask it in His name. Amen. Here we are. We're coming down to the end of the book of James, James chapter 5. And we have some exhortations and encouragements for the believer. Last week we saw that James had some warnings for those who are rich or wealthy, and warning them of the coming judgment of the Lord and their testimony against them for their wealth and their unjust ways of living. And again, it's not wrong to be wealthy, but it is wrong to obtain your wealth unjustly and treat others poorly because of it and live in wantonness and sin. Um, but here we are. We're going to continue on with these thoughts, and we're going to move into what James is now encouraging us as believers to do in these end times. James is bringing all the previous thoughts into focus now to give us some instruction. Notice he starts out verse 7, Be ye therefore, uh, be patient therefore, brethren. That word therefore ties everything now to what he has previously said. He's given us much instruction about how to live the Christian life and talked much about it. He's even talked about patience before. But now he's going to get very practical in this area of patience. Notice, if you will, he says in verse 7, be patient. Goes on to say in verse 7 that the one who is waiting for the harvest has long patience. In verse 8, be ye also patient. In verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for example, of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And then even talks about the patient of Job. He's telling us something, I think. Over and over, be patient, be patient. Be patient. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if patience was so easy to gain as someone just saying the words, be patient? <laughs> wouldn't that be great? <laughs> wouldn't that be? Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure all of us have given that instruction to children at some time in our life, haven't we? Or grandchildren. Now, just be patient. When's supper? Be patient. Be patient. When's Christmas? Be patient. Be patient. <laughs> I remember when I, was, when, I was, when I was a kid, I used to watch a TV show on TV, and uh, I just learned about the clocks and what the hands meant on the clocks and how to read clock time and stuff, and asked my mom, what time does it come on? 
And you know, it's always, well, it'll be on here in time. Just, just have patience. You know, that's been, back before you can just go on the internet and watch whatever you want. You know, you had to actually wait for a show to come on TV. It's terrible times. Horrible times. Yeah, you can only watch things at a certain time of the day. And uh, she said, be patient, you know, be patient. So I asked her, she told me what time it was. So I went up, and she, I left the room, I went up and I turned the hands of the clock to the time. <laughs> oh, look, it's time. <laughs> the show's on now. We all, at some time in our life, struggle with that, right? All of us. I remember my pastor years ago used to say that he had this saying, and, and, and uh, especially when dealing with folks as they're waiting for something to happen in their life, maybe it's a teenager waiting to grow up and become an adult. Let me tell you, it's all not all it's cracked up to me <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> or maybe it's maybe it's the waiting for uh, an anticipation of some event occurring, like a new birth, or uh, here we have the, se the Ron and Gail are selling their house. Something going on that we're waiting for in our lives. Our pastor used to have this saying, and I remember it, and it stuck with me, and it was this: "You cannot rush the washing machine. Just gotta wait." Just gotta wait. It takes its time. It has a cycle. It goes through that cycle, and you gotta wait for it. It's just the way it is at times. But wouldn't it be wonderful if someone could just say, "Be patient," and all of a sudden we have patience? The truth of the matter is, patience is not that easy. James told us earlier in the book of James how we get patience, and if you look back with me. In, James chapter 1, and then we're going to come back and make it very practical. James chapter 1 gives us an idea of that, and that's verse, verses 3 and 4 talk about it. But in James chapter 5, is going to give us some examples of how we can put this into practice. So James chapter 1, it says in verse 3 and 4, well, 2, 3, and 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have her perfect work that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So if you can learn to be patient in life, you can learn that you really lack nothing. Just have patience. God will work. Ever tried to rush the hand of God? God will work in his time. Be patient. Let God do what he's going to do. Let life do what it's going to do. Do what you can, but then have patience. But James tells us there that patience is not something that is gained easily. It is gained through the trial of our faith. It is gained on the rough path. That's where patience is found. It's not found on the smooth highway. It's found on the difficult path of life. We don't get to choose whether or not we're going to walk the road of life that's tough. But we do have the opportunity through those tough times to learn the patient endurance that we need to continue on. An important thing to note in James chapter 5, verse 7, is James not saying, have patience. He's not saying that. He's saying, be patient. That's very different. Because when you have something, it's a possession. But to be something is a state of what you are. Patience is not a destination on a difficult road. Patience is something we develop as we walk the difficult road. Patience is not our destination. Patience is what we are formed into someone who is patient. Patience is not the objective. Patience gives us the strength to continue. The road of life is filled with obstacles and difficulties, Sometimes so much so that we would rather take a U-turn and head back the opposite way, thinking our destination isn't worth the trip. But it's patience that keeps us on the road. Be patient, James says. Be patient. Our patience is gained or we become patient as we walk the rough roads, and it's also needed to walk the rough roads. It's like a muscle. In order to move something of great weight, we need strength. But in order to get strength, we have to move stuff of weight, don't we? It's a muscle you have to push to make it stronger, and as it becomes stronger, you can push harder. 
And as we walk the rough roads and continue on the rough roads, we become patient. And as we become patient, we can continue on the difficult paths of life. So let's look at this tonight, James chapter 5, on being patient. Being patient. Let's begin with a definition of patience. Before we can be patient, we must understand what it is. So I wrote down a few definitions for the word patient here. Hopefully they're helpful to you. The word patience comes from Latin root, patty, which means to endure, to undergo, or experience. And the rest of the word, the shins part, means willing. When we are patient, we are willing to endure. We're willing to undergo. We're willing to wait. Willing to endure. To be patient is to have the quality of enduring evils without murmuring or fretfulness. It's to be able to sustain afflictions of our body and our mind with a fortitude, a calmness, or a submission to God's divine will. To be patient means to not be easily provoked, to be calm under the suffering of injuries or offenses, to not be revengeful. To be patient means to persevere, to be constant in our pursuits or exertion, to be calmly diligent. To be patient means to not be hasty, over-eager or impetuous, but to wait expectantly with calmness and without discontent. I say patience is a virtue. It's a virtue that is gained in a very difficult and trying way. Patience, then, is the idea that we are willing to endure the difficulties of life. We are willing to endure the uh, evils of life. We're, e we're willing to endure the provocations of life. We're willing to persevere in the face of trials. We're not hasty, not impetuous, but wait expectantly for God to move among us. We can do that when we go through things in life with the right attitude. Now the Greek word, that's the English word patience. The Greek word patience is the word makrothumos. Makrothumos. It's a compound word. The word macro means something that is big. It's the opposite of micro. We think of micro as tiny. So microscope does, looks at tiny things, small things. Okay, micro is tiny, macro is very large. Macrothumos, the word thumos is often translated as soul or mind and is a reference to a person's desire or will. So when you put the word macrothumos together, what you get is someone who has a large will or a large degree of will. Someone who's able with fortitude to continue on in the most difficult of circumstances. It's understood by the word translated long-suffering in the Bible. In fact, oftentimes macrothumos is translated long-suffering. That is, being able to suffer for a long time or endure for a long time without falling apart. What does that look like? Patience means, at times, going without that which we would want. Patience means enduring struggles that we would rather not have to face. Patience means standing in line without complaining, even when we'd rather cut to the front. <laughs> My wife and I have a, have a, have a long-standing joke between the two of us, and that is that any time we go to the store and we're ready to check out, I'm not allowed to pick the line that we check out in. Because if I pick the line that we check out in, some of you are like me. You're really good at picking the worst lines to be in, aren't you? I'm serious. You can look at all the lines in the checkout register. There could be one person in front of you at each line. And I guarantee you, the one that I go to, 75 people will make it through the one next to me before we make it through. And I don't know why. 
The person in front of me can have one item and it still takes 20 minutes until I get up to the front. I don't understand it. And while he's standing in line, she calls it the loser line. Every time I do, she's like, you got the loser line again. I'm very good at finding that. When you're standing there in line, though, sometimes and you get a little antsy, you know, and then you want to start saying something. Like, what in the world's going on? What's taking so long? And some people behind you start getting agitated. That's, that's what makes it tough, is when the folks behind you start getting agitated. Sometimes it's good to choose another line, but then again, when I choose another line, that time suddenly becomes slow. And I don't know why, it just does. Patience says, I can wait. I can endure. It's only a little bit of time. What does patience look like? Patience means going sometimes without what we desire. Patience means enduring the struggles we don't want to face. Patience means, patience means waiting when we had rather go forward. Patience means letting someone else have their way, even if we have to give up our own. That's tough. Because we all so much want our way. And we want our will, we want our desires to be met, and we want things to fall in place to benefit us. But patience sometimes means letting go and letting others have their way, even if it means we won't get our own. Patience means not striking out at someone when everything inside of us wants to. Oh boy, there are times when someone knows how to push our buttons just right. We want so much to strike out at that person, and patience tells us we. Patience means putting up with bad behavior without responding with bad behavior in kind. Very difficult thing to do. Oftentimes not a hallmark of our society that wants everything now and doesn't want to be robbed of our rights. Our society even says, why would anyone want to endure those things when they can have everything they want now? But we do so because of what it makes us into. Be patient. Be patient. We see a definition of patience. We see a willingness to endure suffering and struggle because of what benefits us in the end. But then we also see the consideration of patience. Look with me, if you will, at verses 7 through 9. James gives us several things to consider about patience this evening. So we understand what patience is. We understand it's found on the hard road. It's found on a difficult road. But James tells us when you're having to go through these things, let's look at some things to consider. Look at verses 7 through 9 with me. It says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the, before the door. So here James gives us something to remember. He said, if you're, if you're struggling right now, if you're walking a road and it just seems like the trials of life are too much, and you're lacking the endurance and the patience to do so, let me give you something to consider. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. He said, remember this, the Lord is returning and it's not going to be much longer. It's not. The Lord is on His way. The Lord is returning back, and He is coming back to this earth. So endure with patience what is coming, because Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He is. We can look all around and see what the Bible talked about being fulfilled around us. We understand the way the world is supposed to be at Christ's return. As it was... In the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man returns. For in the days of Noah, men were eating and drinking, and they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. 
People were living carefree, having everything they could ever desire, living without any thought of the fact that Jesus, or that the flood was coming. They were living as though the world would go on forever like it was. And yet the fateful day came when Noah entered into the ark and the rain began to fall and all of a sudden life changed very fast. So that's what's going to be like when Jesus comes back. The world's going to be in a state where everyone's just doing their own thing, enjoying their life, living it up. And then everything's going to change. Life as we know it is changed somewhat now. But if we think life has changed now, imagine what it's going to be like when Christ comes back. This is just a reminder that things don't stay the same. They don't. And we go through our life living it as sometimes not a care in the world. And here James is reminding us, if you want to have the patience to endure our lives, if you want to have the patience to endure the struggle, remember this, the difficulties have an end. Christ is coming back. I think of poor Noah. Good night. Here's a man who was living in a time where he had never rained, telling people that it was going to flood. Here's a guy that was building a boat, a giant ark to put animals on. The people around him, what were they thinking? The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was definitely telling folks what was going to happen. People must have thought he was crazy. Yet at the same time, he was right. And though the whole world was wiped out with the flood, except for Noah and his family, saved in that ark, this whole world has lost sight of the fact Christ is coming back. Even sometimes Christians, we forget. It's going to come to an end. The tough times we're facing, they're going to come to an end. There are. Christ is coming back. James compares it to the husbandman in verse 7, the return of our Lord. He said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. And here he's saying, listen, it's like this. It's like a harvest. It takes some time before that harvest is ready. It takes some time. you got to wait. There's a season. You can't rush the washing machine. That's what James was in there. <laughs> There's a cycle. you got to wait. you got to wait it out. But wait with endurance. Love it. We drove to town the other day, and I love to see the corn coming up now. I saw the sunflowers. I love the sunflowers. They're so beautiful. I love seeing the sunflowers. You know, someone had to plant those, and they had to wait for them. They're still waiting for them to get done. There's a time frame. There's a cycle that takes place. And the person who tills the ground knows if you're going to have something good at the end, it's going to take some patience and waiting for it to happen. And Christ, when he went back to heaven and they asked him when he was going to return to this earth, he told them, it is not in my power to know the times or the seasons. So I don't even know. He said, the only one who knows when I'm coming back is the Father. And now it's been 2,000 years. Imagine the patience of Christ waiting to return. 2,000 years now it's been, and he's waiting for the harvest, waiting for the time that it's going to happen. And we with endurance need to wait as well, knowing that Christ will return and everything will be set as it ought to be on his return. Verse 8 goes on to tell us, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord, draweth nigh. There it is, it's coming closer and closer. The word established there, the root word is the word stable. We now use the word established. It's the same word, established, but stable. And it means to set firm, unmoving, and unwavering. That's a good, very de good definition of ha having patience. Firm, unmoving, unwavering in the face of whatever trial is coming. As society uh, uh, turns from God and there's turmoil in our society, Christ is coming back. Stay firm in your beliefs. What will help you when you don't see what it is you would like in life? Remember, Christ is coming back. Let that establish your heart and make it stable. What will get you through tough times? Remember, Christ is coming back. He is. Could be today. Could be tomorrow. Could be the next day. I don't know when, but it is coming. Establish your heart 
Make it firm and set it and decide you're going to stay strong because Christ is coming back. It doesn't mean we'll walk an easy life. It doesn't mean it makes life easier. What it means is we're steadfast and determined to be patient unto the coming of the Lord. Then James gives us another thought about his return. He tells us in verse 7, it's like the harvest. You've got to wait for the harvest to come back. It's going to take rain. It's going to take time. He says in verse 8 that he's to establish our hearts that is stand firm or determined in our hearts to be unwavering into the coming of the Lord because it's coming close. Then in verse 9, grudge not one against another. Brethren, lest you be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. The saying is this, Christ is right around the corner. So consider your actions toward each other. Drop your grudges, drop your anger, drop your frustration, and remember, Jesus is coming back and he's going to set it right. He came first as our sacrifice and now he is returning as judge. This here in this passage is a reflection of the parables that Jesus taught his disciples about what it was like or what it was going to be like. He said, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a husbandman who lent out his vineyard to men. And then he left and took a journey and was gone for quite some time. And while he was away, he sent some of his servants to find out what was going on. And they mistreated some, and they beat some, and they sent some away and killed others. And so the husbandman said, I'll send my son to them and see what they think of my son. They'll respect my son. And they said, this man is the heir, and they killed his son. And the Bible says, one day that husbandman's going to come back. And when he comes back, what's he going to do to those men who mistreated his servants and killed his son? That's what James is saying here. Jesus is coming back. He's going to settle it. He's coming back. He said, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who went on a journey to conquer a kingdom. And while he was gone, wicked men came and, and started to uh, be unruly in his own kingdom. And they set up uh, armies and they set up uh, sentries to watch for the king's return. And they mistreated the, the servants of the king while he was away. And the king eventually came back. The king is coming back. He's right around the corner. He knows it all and he will settle it the way it ought to be. So to have patience or to be patient rather in this life, what James is reminding us is this. We establish our hearts on the fact that it's not going to stay this way. Christ is returning. And number two... He said, if you want to, can something to consider, the second thing to consider is consider those that have endured great affliction as well. Look, if you will, with me at verse 10, he said, Take my brethren the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. So if you need another reminder of why you need to be patient, consider those who have been uh, who have suffered greatly at the hand of the Lord, or by, because of their stand for the Lord, rather. Those that have suffered greatly because of their stand for the Lord, the prophets, those who testified of God, those who proclaimed in the name of God and spoke in the name of God, consider what they endured on this earth at the hand of wicked men. To look at that, let's turn on over just a couple pages back to Hebrews chapter 11, and then we'll come back to James 5 and finish out the last verse in this passage here. But Hebrews chapter 11 talks a little bit about this, beginning in verse 32, of the prophets and what they suffered while speaking for the Lord. It would be a wonderful thing if those who spoke on behalf of God were given accolades and praise and respect and were listened to. Him. But oftentimes that was not the way. In fact, when Jesus spoke to the Jews, he said, which of the prophets did your fathers not kill? Look here with me in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 38. This is kind of as complimentary to what James just said. He said, verse 32, and what shall I more say? For the time should fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of 
Jephthah, David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Isn't that, oh, that's wonderful things the prophets did, isn't there? People raised back to life. I think of Elijah, the widow who was able to survive the famine because he was living with her. And we see all these wonderful things the prophets did. Surely everybody loved them. Well, they did not because of the message that they preached of re-righteousness and repentance. And if you look here with me again in verse number 35, it says others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might receive, obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. James says, or Hebrew says here rather, we look at the good picture of the prophets sometimes and we see all the wonderful, amazing things that they did. But remember, there was affliction, suffering, death. Many of them put to death stonings. Some put to death by the sword. They wandered in sheepskins and goatskins. I heard somebody preaching on this passage of Scripture one time explaining what that was and how that in the old times people would take the skins of animals and they would put them on people and they would wet the skins down to make them expand and they would put them on people and then as they would dry out, the skins would shrink up and eventually crush their lung, the air out of their lungs to where they couldn't breathe. There's a form of torture they would do to people. Many times you see the prophets running for their lives trying to escape the judgment of some king who didn't like what they had to say. That's what Elijah was doing. Hiding out by the brook, hiding out wherever he could to escape King Ahab's vengeance upon him for telling him he needed to turn to God. What James is reminding us is that we may have it tough in this life, if we stand for God, we may really have it tough in this life. But endure it because there's a better resurrection afterward. So much better. We may have it tough. We may have it difficult. We may suffer in this life. We may even be persecuted in this life. But the rewards on the other side are going to be so much greater. If we can add to the prophets, those who have suffered for the name of God and the name of Christ, a wonderful read is Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you've ever read it. John Fox, who lived many, many centuries ago, wrote about the people that had been put to death for the name of Christ during his time and even before his time. Those who had been burned at the stake, those who had been hanged, those who had had their tongues cut out, oftentimes whipped and brutally tortured, some crucified for the name of Jesus. Yet they endured. I read about one, one lady who spoke often of the name of Jesus Christ and was imprisoned for her belief in Christ. She was sentenced to die. And when she was taken out of prison, they told her they had to walk her through the crowd to the place where she would be burned at the stake. And they warned her, do not speak of Jesus as we march you out of prison to have you burn at the stake. On her spirit, she had been in prayer, and her spirit was just overflowing with a love for God. And as she walked through the crowd, she began to tell them more about Christ and praise the name of Christ. So the guards that were bringing her to her execution took her and cut her tongue out so she couldn't talk of the Lord anymore. And as she was being taken to her Execution, she would point up to the sky, point to God. She was burned at the stake for her beliefs. And James says, Remember, remember, consider 
those who have suffered as an example of patience. Patience. Endurance. Continuing on for God in the most difficult of circumstances. And then last, James 5, verse 11, he tells us, Behold, we count them happy which endure. That word happy means blessed in many ways. We count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And what an example that's laid before us. The example of Job. A man who lost everything in this life. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. He lost his children. His wife told him that he should curse God and die. Whether it was out of spite or pity, I don't know. Maybe she just felt so bad for him. Said, why don't you just curse God and get it over with? But Job in his heart would not accuse God unjustly. He would not blaspheme God. But he did question God. He wanted an answer. And he said, Lord, I've not done anything wrong. He said, and I know, but if there's something wrong in my life, you need to show me because I'm going through all this stuff and I don't understand why. I don't have anyone who can speak on my behalf, God. And he, even if I did, how would I understand your answer? Please explain why. And at the end of Job, we find that God never tells Job why. He just says, Job, who made the sunrise? Who made the sunset? Who made the snow to fall? Who fed the lions last night? Who took care of the birds yesterday? Who put the stars in place? Were you there when the water was formed? Were you there when the earth came forth from nothing? Job, were you there? Job had to remember that even though his life had fallen apart, there was still a great God that was watching after him. And though Job wanted an answer from God, Job was satisfied with just knowing God was enough. He turned to God in repentance, and God did bless Job greatly for his endurance. In our life, we're going to face many trials. We're going to face many things. We're going to face injustices. We're going to face the lack of having things. But what James tells us is that when our patience, or when we become patient, let patience have her perfect work. Let patience form us to where we will be complete, lacking nothing. Because even if we don't have what we'd like to have, if we become patient, we can endure whatever happens. I encourage you tonight, as we walk this road of life, as James has reminded us, let us be patient. The Lord is coming back. Be patient. The judge is at the door. Be patient. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Be patient and remember those who have suffered before us. And be patient and remember Job, who though he lost it all, found great reward in trusting God. I encourage you tonight. We're going to walk difficult ways in our lives. We're going to walk difficult paths in our lives. But let us allow those paths to form us into those who are patient. Let's pray. Father, I just want to ask you tonight and... We don't get to choose the path we walk. We don't get to choose always the difficulties we're going to face and the trials that we are going to endure. And I'm sure if our life was laid out before us ahead of time and we got to see everything that was going to take place, there would be oftentimes something in us that would say, Father, please take that from my life. I don't want to have to face that. Yet it is those very difficulties, it is those very struggles in our life that form us into what we need to be and part of that is patient. Father, I pray you would help us in the tough times to trust that you are enough even when we've lost everything else in our life. Father, please give us the grace to be patient unto the coming of the Lord. We do look forward to that day and we even pray, Lord, please come quickly. 
We ask, Father, for thy will to be done and for thy kingdom to come. But until that time, Lord, help us to be established in our hearts, settled, stable, firm until the coming of the Lord. I want to thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture from James. and Help us to go in your grace. I know we're not perfect, Lord. I know we're not 100% everything we were going to be when we're in heaven. But Lord, please help us and in the strength that we need now. Thank you so much again for tonight. We ask your blessing now in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>